gathered family, we rejoice in God's love and care. We rejoice in that anthem that we are sinners saved by grace. We rejoice that we can have fellowship with one another. Thus, our Psalter for today will be reading number 689 in the Red Hymnal. I remind you that this is a responsive reading. I will read the lighter print. You all will read together the darker print. Let us join together in our Psalter, number 689, titled Fellowship. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and saw it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are right in this, that our joy may be complete. This is the message that we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let us pray. Father, forgive us our sins, save us from all unrighteousness, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those who are most need of your mercy. Sisters and brothers in Christ, we are continuing in ordinary time, continuing in the season of celebration, that God is growing us, that God is renewing us, that he is strengthening us and enabling us to rise up and be so much more. With that in mind, let us hear this reading from Micah. We'll be reading today in the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 14 and going down through verse 20. Pray that our hearts and minds are open, that we may hear what Scripture is saying to us, church. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock that belongs to you, which lives alone in a forest, in the midst of a garden land. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, show us marvelous things. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall lay their hands on their mouths. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick dust like a snake, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall come out trembling of their fortress. They shall turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall stand in fear of you. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of your possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in showing clemency. We will again he will again have compassion upon us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast out all our sin into the depth of the sea. You shall show faithfulness to Jacob and unswerving loyalty to Abraham, as you have sworn to our ancestors from the days of old. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We're now going to continue with our reading from Acts. We'll be in the 7th chapter beginning at verse 51 and going down through verse 60. 
this is the end of Stephen's speech to those who are about to stone him, those who are about to send him to be with the Lord. I pray that we will hear these words and that we will turn back to our gracious and loving God as Scripture should always call us to do. May we hear what Scripture is saying to us, the church. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do, which the prophets did. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When he said this, he died. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May all who have heard these words trust that they come from our good, gracious, and loving God, and they are to rebuke us, to strengthen us, and to enable us to rise up and be so much more. This time, I invite those who will be part of our church time.
have our heart, when we follow Jesus and Jesus is in our heart, he brings us peace. And so we aren't bothered by the worry and confusion that Satan tries to bring. And then there's the helmet of salvation. Jesus came to earth to save us that we just sang about, that we are sinners saved by grace. And uh, so we put on our helmet of salvation to remember to follow Jesus and that he saves us. And the sword of the Spirit is the Bible. God's holy word is our powerful weapon against Satan. So all of that is the armor of God. And just like those football players need protective equipment, so do we. And God gives it to us. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us armor so that we can fight the battles of this world and know that you are our peace, you are our strength, and you um, have saved us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Diane was talking about the evil one is the one we need to have that armor to protect ourselves against. Of course, when you're reading scripture sometimes, I hope there's statements that slap us in the face, that, that wake us up and we have to go, is, is that me? Have, have we taken on this identity? You may have been feeling slapped, I don't know, of Barbara standing up here and saying that she was a sinner. You may not want to think of yourself as a sinner. I hope nobody here is thinking that way. A pastor friend of mine had a shocking interaction with his presbytery when he was going through to be ordained. They were uh, examining him, as is often the case, and he referred to and talked of how he wanted to be a good shepherd to the flock that God would send him to. And a person got up and said, are you saying that we're all sheep? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's what scripture tells us constantly, that we are the sheep and God is the good shepherd. We should also identify completely with this first verse that I read in Acts. I hope each of us recognizes that when it says, you stiff-necked people, that is me and it's each one of us. We are the stiff-necked people. We all have a heart condition. I hope we're all working on that heart condition, working on being renewed and restored by our God, as our baptismal vow says, to turn back to our God. I hope we live in that reality that we need to constantly be turning back to God, that we have a tendency to turn away from God. The sad reality is there are many of us who unintentionally take these statements that God is shepherding us from Micah, that God is caring for us, that he does not retain his anger forever and we sugarcoat our sinfulness. We think way too much about being saved by grace instead of recognizing our brokenness and living in that brokenness. Living in the reality that we can easily be brainwashed into thinking the wrong thing. That we can think we're walking along as companions of God and we very easily went down that slippery slope and have become the enemies of God. That we're in league with the devil, with Satan, with whatever name you want to use for the evil in the world. If we're not recognizing that we are stiff-necked, if we're not recognizing that I, Roy Scarborough, or 
you, whatever name you want to call yourself at this moment, are stiff-necked and hard-hearted, we're becoming part of the problem. There is much debate over what events will look like the rest of this year. We constantly talk, will we do this? Will we do that? I'll tell you fully, my plan is not to be fighting anybody or to stand up to anything. I was walking through Kroger. I just happened to have had a mask in my pocket because I had just been to the doctor and all the doctors are still saying they want masks. And they said, we're asking all people who are not vaccinated to wear masks. And if you are vaccinated, if you would please wear a mask. <laughs> I went, well, why? Put my mask on. Why? Because I'm not going to cause a scene. I don't want to be causing anybody else stress. I don't know what masks do or don't do, but if they were going to ask me to wear one, I'll wear it. Because I'm all about submitting and be gracious and kind and dealing with wherever people are. We're planning on having a beautiful, fabulous homecoming. But if there comes out some recommendation from our state government that we shouldn't be meeting, we won't be having it. It may end up being like last year's homecoming. We were planning not to have food. We were asking people to come, and it ended up being the lowest attendance Sunday we'd had in a long time because people were afraid there would be crowds of people. Again, if you were one of those people that didn't come, I'm not condemning you because we've all got to figure out how we're going to live our lives. But we need to be mindful that, well, we need to be careful and not infect one another. We also need fellowship. I remind you again of that first Sunday that we came back in May of 2020, the 23rd Sunday. And you all were so thrilled to be seeing each other. You were standing far apart with your masks on talking because you hadn't been able to talk to each other in person in so long, you were about to explode. You were all like my friend's dog. You get so excited at seeing people, it makes a mess. You hadn't made a mess yet, but you were getting close. You were excited. <laughs> We're all sinners. We're all broken. We're trying to figure out how to get through this. But we don't need to become like these people that Stephen was dealing with, these scribes and Pharisees, these religious leaders, the people that knew God's law so wholly and completely, and yet when he pointed out what they all should have known, because again, the recorded, the recorded history of Israel was that they persecuted the prophets. That we include the prophets in the Jewish text, the Old Testament, that we have that in our Bible, points out how we are constantly in need of turning back to God. That the condition of everyone's heart is to walk away from God, even though you think you're walking with God. We can be so easily distracted from grief, from uncertainty, from things happening, the, the struggles of life, of our bodies not responding like they used to. Any of these things can turn us into those Pharisees and Sadducees, those people that Stephen was telling about God's glory and truth, and they put their hands over their ears. The deaf people that Micah was talking about, they've lost their minds. We all have that heart condition to go away from God. We don't know what struggles Stephen had in his life. You know, I always like to stop and point that out. We're only getting snapshots of people's faithful journeys. You know, if Stephen lived long enough, he very well may have been like that prophet of the Old Testament. You may remember that fellow that ended up in the belly of the whale. Jonah was a great and mighty prophet and had done a really good job proclaiming God's mercy and grace until God said, oh, by the way, go give mercy and grace to the Ninevites. Do you have a Ninevite group in your household or in your family or anybody that you know, somebody that you're like, oh, Lord, here they come. Give me strength, God, give me strength. <laughs> You may have someone in your neighborhood, someone that you see on a regular basis. It may just be that group of people that your favorite news station talks about as being the outcasts and the terrorists. Who knows? Have you noticed that sad reality of our news reporting? It's no longer us, the people of America. It's there's the patriots and the terrible people. And which station you're listening to tells you whether you're in the patriot group or the terrible people group. I mean, what is wrong with our world that we think that's okay? We have gotten so broken. We are so, so lost. But we think we're fine. That's the scary part. 
Again, I hope I'm talking to you and you're not having any moments of uncomfortableness or feeling like I'm stomping on your toes. But if you're getting your toes stomped on, don't worry. Mine are raw and sore because God's been jumping on them all week. <laughs> and why do I say that? Because so many people think us pastors have a different life that we don't endure stuff like anybody else. I'm like, uh, okay. That's not reality, but if that's what you believe, I'm trying to help pull you back to some reality. We all have struggles. We all have things we deal with. And God calls us to recognize our heart condition. To recognize that if you have fears, well, other people probably have fears too. But talking about all our fears, we also need to talk about our God. That's how we help our heart condition. That we talk about our gracious and wonderful God. Yes, we're sinners and we are saved by grace. Hallelujah. You've got to have both parts of that together. We've got to recognize we're stiff-necked and that we have a God who wants to take that stiffness away. We need to recognize that our hearts are broken in sin. They're black and terrible, but God wants to give us a new heart. He wants to renew our heart. He wants to restore us and enable us to be so much more. That's why Scripture continually tells us to be thankful. Have you thought of how that helps your heart condition, that being thankful? Well, it recognizes there's so much stuff that happens to us that we have absolutely, positively no control over. I mean, the whole reality of this virus, it's one of the absolute worst in terms of you get it, you're carrying it, you're infecting people so long before you know you have it or you could infect people. The reality of all viruses is, even if it's just the little old cold virus, you don't know you have it until it's too late. You've infected people. Suddenly, we've got this fear of what we might do with a virus. Well, yes, we should have always had that fear with a virus. We should always be mindful that you could infect somebody with anything. We need to be mindful as well that we can infect people with our worry, our sadness, our brokenness, our concern, or we can tell them about our good, gracious, and loving, almighty, powerful Heavenly Father. What are we spreading? That's why I'm saying we're going to have homecoming. Because when I say that we might not, the sadness that comes upon you is real. We love to get together. We love to eat. We're Presbyterian. Hallelujah. <laughs> we need to recognize we've got to have both together. We have to be cautious and be mindful, but we still have to live. I found on the internet that another person who was feeling this same struggle, who had their toes stomped on by reading scripture, found a comment by C.S. Lewis. He lived in England right around the uh, middle of 1950 was when he was writing the article. Anyway, I can't think of the time frame. My mind lost that term for this moment, whatever. But he lived in the 50s, right when the atomic era was coming upon us and people were all weighted down with the fear of the atomic bomb. Oh gosh, atomic bombs are going to end our lives. He said, yes, that's what we call out today. Let's think back of a century or two when they had that other plague. For that was the fear every year. Are we going to die of the plague? And oh wait, before that they had the Vikings, who those Norwegianers who were of my descent, that's where Scarborough comes from. It's like, we're going to come around and slit your throats. What are you going to die from? The sad reality of the world is we're not finding better ways to live. We're finding new ways to die. You know, the reality, if we read about the family lineage of my family, there were all sorts of things they died from that they called one thing, and now they discovered, oh, it was this, and it was that. Right. You know, that my dad and I have this genetic issue where we're starting to lose control from our knees and elbows out. Dad is much, much farther along with it. I'm wearing a knee brace currently right now because my knees are acting up. It's like, have I done something to it, or is it that? I don't really know. My dad thought that his dad laid in bed the last years of his life because he had just worn out his body. He didn't know there was a genetic thing that had stopped his body from working. I've talked to many people who are in the end of life, and they said, you know, if I'd known I would have lived this long, I would have treated myself better. We have a heart condition. 
We don't know how to live. We can be told how to live and still not follow it. Again, the standard problem I encounter with folks in the hospital is dehydration has led them to be in the hospital. You would think in this nation where there are water bottles almost everywhere, there's water fountains, we have more clean water than anywhere else on the planet. You would think the standard statistic would not be that 70% of our nation is dehydrated. If you've not been reading the Bible, guess what you are? You've got a dehydrated soul. You're making your heart condition worse. If you're not continually acknowledging that you are a sinner saved by grace, both of those together, you're making your heart condition worse. If you're like me and Barbara that cry a lot, well, good, that's not a bad thing. If you're a person that doesn't cry, that's okay too. But the whole reality is we should have great rejoicing when we hear that sinner saved by grace. If we've not, we need, we've let our heart condition get worse instead of better. Again, this has been a week of conviction for me. I'm not trying to ruin your all's day. I'm trying to remind you that we can have great and eternal hope in acknowledging our sinfulness and rejoicing in our Savior already forgiving us. We keep the cross before us because we need to be reminded that we have a God who died for us. We need to claim that loving gift again and again and again because we have a heart condition that leads us from our God. And hallelujah, our joining in to the church, our joining in to God's family is not that we will ever be perfect, but that we can turn back to our God. Our baptismal vow, first one, that we have a great and amazing Savior, that is Jesus Christ. And that he with the Father and the Spirit work together to redeem us, renew us, and restore us. The second one, that we can turn back to our God. And we need to turn back. And that we are going to work at turning back all our life through. And the third, that we meet together with other believers and be encouraged and empowered and go out and do God's work in the world. All three together will bring us to a renewed and restored heart. Will allow us to live abundantly each and every day. That whether we're in sickness or in health, whether we are in need or in want, that we can trust that our God has us, that our God holds us, and that his love is sufficient each and every day. Gathered family, let us rejoice that God is working on the condition of our heart and that we can rise up and be renewed and restored. Let us give God thanks and praise this day and forevermore. To God be the glory. Amen. Sisters and brothers, I invite you to turn to the back of your red hymnal, where we'll find our Nicene Creed, which is our affirmation of faith this day. I pray that you will be able to stand and join with me as we affirm our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before our worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, was made man, and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he arose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.